Welcome to Simply Local. I'm Pam Uten, Family and Consumer Science Agent with the Cooperative Extension. And I'm David Goforth, Horticulture Agent with the Cooperative Extension. Pam, today I want to talk about winter squash. Oh, David, I'm really looking forward to this because I know you grew this squash. I grew this winter squash. In fact, I've grown all, ty all three types that we've got here today, or four types. Uh, this we call an acorn squash. Uh, this we call a butternut squash. And this one is a spaghetti squash. And then this one's called Buttercup. And there's actually a couple more. There's one called a Hubbard squash that's very popular. Uh, actually, winter squash are a little bit popular farther north than this because they can do a little bit better job growing them some years. We have a little hard time figuring out exactly, exactly. when to plant them. But I did plant these around the 1st of June. 1st of June, and they got ripe over in the fall of the year, and I, I felt very good about the job that I did on these particular ones right here. Uh, winter squash are actually three different uh, species that uh, are actually, yeah, I count them, spaghetti squash, it's four different mm -hmm. species of squash. We call them all winter squash, basically because they've got a little bit harder shell, and they will store. This one has been stored since I harvested it in late October, was when I picked this one, and I've actually put it outside in a insulated room so you know some places people talk about root cellars and they have to have root cellars they store very well in root cellars but here we don't totally need a root cellar because these have gone through again zero degree temperature this year outside except they were in an insulated room and I've still got them to eat this time of the year which is what we call the hungry moon the hungry moon <coughs> yeah so uh, winter squash well, we can do a couple of things with it now normally uh, what I do with it is I always take it towards the sweet dessert side oh. as traditional you know add a little bit of sweeteners to it we'll talk about sweeteners in a Minute, okay. but add a little bit of sweeteners to it, a little bit of oil to it, and then we, uh, but in studying this, I've learned that you can also take it to the savory side. Yes. And so I'm going to do one of those, Pam, and we'll uh, experiment a little bit and see if I can do a savory one. Now, you know, in experimenting with cooking, I always like to do that, <laughs> because you know why? Why? If you're careful, you can always eat your mistakes. Oh, well, definitely, David. <laughs> now, if you get them burnt, sometimes you can't, but generally you can eat your mistakes. Now, one of the things here, somebody told me I to take a hatchet to get this thing And open. you want me to hold it a no, little bit? No, no, okay. no. I'm or sometimes maybe doing it on a damp cloth might even anchor it a ah, little bit better. There we go. Okay. Gorgeous. And I've got a... This is a grapefruit spoon, mm -hmm. and grapefruits, of course, are not designed for human consumption, in my opinion. What? Wait a minute, stop. <laughs> that was a biased statement. Grapefruits are very nutritious foods. But I don't eat them. But anyway, I can use a spoon yes. to clean out winter squash. Now, these seeds, I'm just tossing them away here. Uh, some people will cook them. You can lightly toast them. You have to very, and I've done that before, and sometimes I'll save them and plan to do it and never get it done. Uh, a lot of times I just toss them. Well, you know, David, I was reading, because uh, I knew you were the squash pro, and I didn't have a whole lot to do for this one, but really you can roast all the seeds of winter squash. Uh, your squash that you're using, the spaghetti, the butternut, the acorn, and of course, the pumpkin, the most popular, probably winter squash that we have. The yeah, the pumpkin is actually the same species of. Well, there's actually, like I said, there's four different species here, but this species and this species, uh -huh. the. Uh, Pumpkins are the same species, you know, so it's really more of a tribe, if you will, than actually a. Uh... Now, some people will take it, uh, and you could do this in the microwave. I normally do it in the oven, but uh, some people will take and do the thing hull and all, and then they can scrape it out of the hull, which is a very good way of doing it. But uh, a lot of times, I'll just go ahead and cut the thing apart, get rid of the uh, skin, and be done with it. <laughs> Well, right. with our spaghetti squash, uh, just real recently in a class, we microwaved, we punched holes, and we microwaved it for about five minutes, and then the skin was a lot easier to slice. Yeah. So, so that's always an option. Yep. Uh, spaghetti squash, by the way, don't store near as well as this winter squash. Uh, most of the spaghetti squash that you would have tried to store around your home, you probably want to get that eat by about November. Uh, it was so better than a summer squash, but... Uh, Anyway, I mean, so you're kind there. of chopping those up or breaking them into larger pieces or exactly. cutting them into larger pieces. Getting the skin off. And I try to get down below where the green's at on there. I don't think I'm wasting very much doing it this way. You know, David, I think a lot of people are kind of hesitant 
to try squash, winter squash. We've done some other things with winter squash before and I've had several people stop me and say, I had never done an acorn squash. I had never done a butternut squash. So this is a good culinary introduction. But remember, you can always eat your mistakes. You can always, that lets us <laughs> remember that. In Simply Local, we can always eat our mistakes. All right. And I'll keep doing this until I get the amount I want there. And you know, I, don't, I know you don't particularly like to think about this, but consumers now can buy cubed squash in the frozen food section, particularly for uh, butternut squash and acorn squash. So if you're trying to do this and don't have access to the fresh, of course we're promoting the fresh, you can buy it in the frozen food section, already cubed. That's like paying somebody to do your fishing, isn't it, Pam? Well, no, I think it works <laughs> if you're a busy person and want to get a healthy meal on the table. All right, let's talk about sweeteners now, Ben, we're going to push this towards the dessert side of things. Uh, I've got local sweeteners, we've basically got three options. We've got the maple syrup, the sorghum syrup, and the honey. honey. Okay. Uh, and to the best of my knowledge, I'm the only commercial syrup producer in Cabarrus County. Oh. Uh, this is normally done a little bit farther north, but I have this is mine. I've mm -hmm. done this, and I'll normally make about three gallons, so it's going to be hard to find local uh, <laughs> maple three syrup. Three gallons totally. For the, the whole season. For the year. For most the years. year. Okay. Our best year was five gallons. Five this gallons. This year was closer to three gallons. So that's gallons. worth liquid gold. Well, not really. I can't sell it for that much, but uh, <laughs> I, I do sell a good price. Okay, I'm okay. getting sidetracked. I'm sorry. This one here, this is the first year I've done this. Now, this is sorghum. Sorghum is from sorghum cane, which is different than sugar cane. I'll talk about sugar cane in a minute. But uh, sorghum cane was introduced to Cabarrus County probably around 1860, hmm. right before the Civil War, and was done very regular in, you know, say the 100 years after the mm -hmm. Civil War, but it's been sort of sporadic in recent years. And I've uh, did this one this year, sort of brought it back a little bit for historical reasons, but also because I like the taste and the only way to really make sure you're getting the good stuff is to uh, get it yourself. And this, we will have this for sale, lo it is for sale locally right now. And of course the honey is another option for a local sweetener, which we do have beekeepers in Cabarrus County that do a good job. Uh, but they don't quite produce enough for all of us. Some people have to go to the store and get their honey, uh, which is unfortunate because uh, some of the honey actually, is, it's not legal for them to ship honey straight from China, but a lot of the honey in the store originated in China somewhere because uh, it's been micro-filtered to take out the pollen. So it's been adulterated in some ways like that. And the only reason to microfilter it to take out the pollen is so people don't know it came from China. But so. on a positive note, we do have a large group of Cabarrus beekeepers. Yes. So we're going to maybe you be getting You search around, more, you can find some. We're yeah. going to be getting more honey. All right. Local now, honey. Now, uh, this here is sugarcane that has been cooked down to a liquid syrup. And it's sugar cane, sir. Have you ever tasted this? I don't think I have. Well, just get you a spoon somewhere here. Okay. And we'll let you have a little bit of a taste of it. I tell you what I'm gonna do, Pam. I'm gonna let you taste this first. Oh. Which is a little bit of sorghum. Uh, see if we can pour that out there and. Just a taste now. Yep, it's just a taste because okay. I want to give you some real good stuff here to. Uh, your first experience with these liquid uh, sweeteners. Okay. And <laughs> are you, am I ready? Yeah. Are you familiar with the sorghum at all, by the way? Mmm. It's very good. It is. Now, the very reason good. I did that first, and I'll do that last for dessert so you can get okay. this taste out of your mouth, this is not quite as good. I'll tell you that up front. Okay. But uh, this is sugar cane that has been to a liquid form and is, is called uh, syrup. Syrup, okay. Cane, cane syrup. Well, now, David, you know the average consumer isn't going to be able to do this. Taste them like that? That's why you're doing it for them on oh, television okay, here. okay, great. Mmm, <laughs> thick. It's sweet. Almost reminds me of molasses. Really uh, does. Now, molasses, what are you talking about when you say molasses? Well, molasses. Yeah, that is the trouble because uh, of what's called molasses. Uh, molasses is really when you take sugar cane and you process it down to our sugar. This is sugar, this is a very fine crystal, but different sized crystal sugar that is white 
they'll take this stuff out and they'll call it uh, molasses, mm -hmm. cane molasses. And in my mind, cane molasses is not really fitting for human consumption. There's a lot of it that's used for cattle feed. There's a lot of it that's used for, uh, I mean, this is sold for human consumption or whatever. But there's a lot of it used for cattle feed. There's some of it used for fertilizer. And there's some of it that are used for, you know, people say it's got all the vitamins and stuff, you know, because the vitamins are not here, obviously. All the vitamins and minerals and micronutrients and phytonutrients and stuff from the cane are into the cane molasses. So the molasses don't taste near as good as this to me. They leave a bitter, you get that bitter taste mm -hmm. still in your mouth? A little bit, okay. yes. And so that's the, the confusion is, uh, what really makes it confusing though is years ago, Sorghum syrup was called molasses. molasses. Oh, that does get confusing. It does. You've got a. You remember the recipe book that y'all had preserving our heritage? Right. Extension and Community Association members did that book several years ago. Yeah, there was a recipe in there for molasses cake. Ah. So what yes. do you think they would have used? Well. What was it designed for? Molasses, but sorghum or? Molasses or sorghum, sorghum? or? Actually, uh, it was designed for the sorghum, sorghum, is what would do the best results with that particular recipe. And so when we talk about the older generation, they talk about molasses in this area, it is more than likely that they're talking about this. Now, the cane is a semi-tropical plant, and it has been grown commercially as far north as South Carolina. Probably somebody's tried it in North Carolina before, but it's a tropical plant. You would have to mulch it very heavily to keep it alive, and it doesn't give you quite as good results as the sorghum. So most anything called cane, and most anything between, say, 1850 and 1950, your heritage recipes that call for molasses was probably calling for sorghum Sor syrup, syrup mm -hmm. right here. Uh, now, just, you get on down the line here, you've got the, uh, the again, the molasses is separated out from the, uh, the, the the sugar, sugar cane goes into sugar and it makes the molasses which uh, are down here mm -hmm. and what they do now is they'll spray a little bit of the molasses back on the brown sugar just to give it the color uh, it gives it a different taste uh, gives it the color but nutritionally wise these two are not that much different and then the corn syrup now when I was a kid I thought they run corn stalks through a cane no. mill and got the juice no. they don't I learned that later I know that now <laughs> Pam uh, this is actually derived from starch corn starch through an industrial process chemical process they derive it into now this is actually a mixture of called corn syrup and high fructose corn, corn syrup. syrup. Two different uh, things there. Both of them though are derived from the starch. They don't run a uh, corn stalk through the cane mill <laughs> to get uh, corn syrup. Now, we give a lot of nutritional advice on this show, Pam, but probably the most important nutritional advice we could give is, is that right here is, is where the battle with obesity is lost. Uh, we can say that the average American needs to cut down on their sugar, total sugar, not, not separating out any of these, just saying total sugar, Every American needs to cut down a little bit. Definitely. Okay, so that if, if you if you, people do this, nothing else, we'd like for them to listen to that. Uh, this was really driven home to me recently when I looked. I saw a barrel that was used years ago. The settlers in this area mm -hmm. would go to Charleston mm -hmm. to get uh, their supplies right. once a year. Uh, well, the Germans would go to Federal, the Irish would go to Charleston uh -huh. to get their supplies. And this guy was showing me a barrel. The barrel was about that big and about that high. And he said this was the sugar that they brought back for a year's time. And so I got to calculate the weight. You know, it's about four pounds of sugar per person that they were using this time back in the 1750s and so 1760s, 1780s. Uh, today, we are feeding our kids. In 20 days, we're feeding them a year's worth of sugar. Does that tell you anything? That's too much. That's way too much. <laughs> too much. Too much. Yeah. <laughs> and so we can definitely say that. Now, as far as which of these are better, you'll hear a lot of people talking about these, which are locally, as being preferable. These have still got all these have got minerals, they've got vitamins, they've got uh, different a little bit of protein in this one right here. Uh, everything that was in the corn juice is concentrated down into this one. Everything that's in the maple sap is concentrated down into that one. Our research is not very clear on that, uh, but we can. one thing I would say is if you had taken, when you're cutting it down, the more you can shift it towards this end, perhaps the better off you would be uh, to uh, keep from eating as much of it. Anything to eat less of it is uh, very, very important as far as that. But we will use a little bit here in our... Uh, and when you say a little bit, you mean a little bit of... Any sweetener. Any sweetener. Yeah. Okay. We we'll let you choose, Pam. No, talking. no, you're you're the chef. Okay. On this well, show. I'll, I'll just choose. Uh, we'll we'll go with the uh, sorghum. Sorghum. The uh, we're gonna put a little bit of olive oil on here 
to uh, just sort of coat the top of it, make it cook a little bit better. Now there'll be some moisture that'll come out as it cooks. Sure. And so, but it just seems to me like it does a little bit better if I have just a little bit of olive oil brushed on top. Now, David, the, way, the, the, the consumers at home want to know how much is a little bit. It looks like maybe. Two tablespoons? That's exactly what I had in mind. Two, two tablespoons. tablespoons. Okay, right. great. I'll take the olive okay. oil then. And we go we are going to use say this sweetener right here. And I'll put a little bit of it on there. And this is the sorghum. Right? Sorghum syrup. And they can buy that at the farmer's market, is that right? Uh, I Sometimes. know it's at Peach Tree Market right now. Peach Tree Market, yeah, okay. Of course I'll probably have some at the farmer's market myself when I get up there this summer. Okay. All right. And that is ready to go in the that was probably about a teaspoon of sorghum, would you say? Yeah. At least and a teaspoon. That's one of the things on the these sweeteners here, the natural uh, sweeteners that we can find local. Uh, you don't you don't want to eat as much as you do. As they're very concentrated. Is that maybe what we're saying? No, I'm saying that they're more satisfying. More satisfying. I could probably drink half of that this afternoon. I still want more. Oh. Take about two tablespoons of that, and, and you've had enough. That's enough. My body is saying, "Whoa, wait a minute." It's We've concentrated got enough. Yeah. and satisfying. That's the the satisfaction is higher with these right here. I think I can safely say that from personal experience. Again, I'm not looking at research. I'm just saying the way it affects my body. All right. At this point in time, that's ready to go to the oven. But we, now the other thing we want to do is we're going to do one that's a little bit savory, and uh, you probably only do one of these at a time when you're at home. You know, just sure, do one. But, but we're showing. Yeah. We're so showing. let me get the other one cut up a little bit here and we will talk savory. Uh, David, now you said put it in the oven, so we're going to bake this at about 350 degrees. Yeah. Ro are we roasting or more we're roasting, baking? Roasting. We're roasting, so it'd be a little bit higher temperature then. I've done it at 300. It's a matter of the lower temperatures, you just have to do it longer. Definitely. It's the way it works. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so. Roasting, you usually think about a little bit higher temperature than um, yeah. you do for um, baking. You know, you could probably fool a child and tell them they're eating pumpkin or something like that to encourage children to eat vegetables. You can fool more than the children on this. Uh, you go to the store and buy a pumpkin in the store, mm -hmm. you're actually buying winter squash. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. They, they will grow a type of, in fact, if I'm not mistaken, they don't do it around here for the commercial, but if I'm not mistaken, it's a type of buttercup squash is what they're growing for commercial pumpkins. Might be something to research sometime, but uh, it's, a, it's a winter squash that is, that you will, when you open a can of pumpkin from the store, you're getting winter squash. That's interesting. I always think I'm buying pumpkin from the can. You know, talking about, we could tell children this was pumpkin, kind of, you know, adding a little bit of sweetness. Sometimes it's a challenge to get children to try vegetables. Well, adults too. Well, it's partly, uh, again, one reason I like and encourage people to eat locally is this here will be no problem for a kid to eat this. Kids, uh, parents come up to me at the farmer's market and they say, my kids won't eat vegetables. And I ask them, I, have you ever fed them some of my vegetables? <laughs> I mean, seriously, you know, and, and uh, I don't blame kids for not eating some of these vegetables, you know. Uh, the kids are telling you the right thing. I mean, you know, they, they're not stopping. They're telling well, you the stuff's really good. Well, could I something from another perspective, too? Give it to me from another perspective, Okay, fam. another perspective is that it often takes a child as many as 20 tries with the new food before they like it. So definitely eating the local vegetables is a tastier option. But, in, but parents, I hope you'll keep in mind that it honestly may take a child 20 exposures to a new vegetable for them to eat it. So don't give up. If you're Keep giving something sorry trying. to them, it may take them longer than that. David, again, I say. It's a good stuff. I, I, bet, I wish we had some kids to test it on, Pam. I, know. I believe we could taste this for a kid right here and he'd put it in his mouth and away he'd go. Oh, I know he would because it's a good, fresh, local <laughs> vegetable. But some not so good vegetables, uh, or maybe some that are not as appealing, it may take a few more uh, tries. Let's stop right here. Let's put okay. some. Uh, now, take this sort of. Sort of towards a savory uh, side as opposed to a uh, sweet, side. sweet side dessert. Uh, I thought I'd throw in a couple of carrots. Now these carrots, I pulled them, I planted them last uh, August. Mm -hmm. August is time to plant carrots around here. I use a chatney because of our clay soils. And I pulled these somewhere in December, I think, before it got cold weather. They would not last. Now with the temperatures we've had, they'd rot up to about here. Mm -hmm. So I had to pull them. I just left them out on the porch where it's not heated. And they're in still in pretty good shape. Uh, 
So I will peel them and add them into here to the uh, dish and we'll roast them along with them. Carrots are so, those carrots are so pretty and orange. And I know you're going to say because they're locally grown. Well, because I grew them. How's that? Oh, okay. They were locally <laughs> grown by you. <laughs> no, they, they, you have a real advantage over me, David. I'm not that much of a gardener. Actually, I want you to try one of those. Oh, okay. Thank yeah. you. Let me do one more in here. Mm, good. Yep. And how many go. times would it take me to get a kid to eat that? Um, David, it may take more than one. Okay. Right? It is a vegetable after all. <laughs> <laughs> you know how you could solve that, though, is if you let the kid grow it. Or visit the farmer's market and help their parents pick, pick it, it out. out. Yeah. I actually, I did have some kids come over and help me dig mm -hmm. these things, and they had no problem eating the ones they dug. So that was helpful, too. All right. They were probably so glad to see the finished product after working so hard. Well, after you know, seeing what a carrot mm -hmm. looks like, oh, that's what the leaf looks like, and pulling it out, they were excited Amazed. about doing that. Yes. Okay. Now I'm gonna put a garlic in here, and guess where does garlic come from, Pam? Your garden, your farm. Actually, my backyard. Your backyard. Yeah. Uh, they they're already coming up for this year. This is about the latest that I would want to. Uh, dig them and use them. Uh, they're going to come up and multiply and I'd be able to use them again probably by about June, but uh, let's throw one in here for taste anyway. Uh, now, I don't know if I need to peel this up or not. I think I will peel it just a touch. Garlics are pretty um, pungent, aren't they? And a definite <laughs> flavor. <laughs> yeah, in fact, you will... Uh, you don't you, think I'd like it, is that what you're no, saying? You, one is enough for the entire dish. That whole dish will have that flavor of the garlic there when we finish. Okay, need to put a little bit of oil. Olive oil. Well, olive oil. There it is. There the it magic is. olive oil yes. again. And uh, this is a bigger dish, so we're putting about two tablespoons on it. Two tablespoons or a little yep. bit more. And again, we need fats. We just don't need too much of them. All right. I'm happy with that. Now, we can... Uh, what kind of spice are you going to put on this one? Well, uh, I like basil, I like thyme, I like rosemary. What do you have? Uh, well, this one's got a mixture of rosemary and stuff. Uh-huh. What's uh, your favorite? Thyme. Thyme, okay. Of, of these, the savory, mm -hmm. you got tarragon is the one. Mm -hmm. Did you mention tarragon? I don't think I did mention tarragon. Now, tarragon would have been a choice, but uh, sprinkle a little bit of this over top of it here once I get it coming out. Mm-hmm. Isn't that pretty? Adding some color. All right. And all that will go into the oven. So if you okay. can slip those two in the oven and... You're ready for me to put them in the oven, yep. all right? And then I'll be ready for you to bring them back when they're done. Okay. Here's our fir first sample. All right. Uh-oh. This too smells uh, delicious. All right. <clears throat> Let me have one in pot holders. Okay. <laughs> Just like at home, isn't it? Yes. All right, Pam, what's this tool called here? That's a potato masher. All right, probably a second or third generation potato masher. It looks like it and is. And this is the one that is the savory one here. I'm going to mash it up a little bit, and then you can either use it as a base and put some uh, meat on top of it, or use it as a side dish. And I didn't get to the trouble of cooking any uh, venison for you, Pam, but oh, you'll have David. to imagine that. Or you can imagine some of Chad's sausage on oh, it Oh, that would be delicious, too. Yeah. So, I'm going to try to mix those. Uh, Know, would, would you have gotten the garlic out before you done this, or? Well, I probably would have, but. Yeah, I mix mix it in, so I reckon we're all right on that. And the carrots are not quite as tender, so I'm, that's what I'm fighting here is getting the carrots mixed in with it. There we have went savory with this dish, and again, this is not a traditional one that I'm familiar with around here, but I've tried it and I think I'm pleased with it. <laughs> Great. What about you? I think it looks delicious. <laughs> and this one, uh, you can eat it as is, or you could you could mash that too. But uh, basically, a lot of times I'll eat it like that, just as the uh, chunks as a dessert there. So, as I was saying here on the plate, we can uh, serve it two ways. We can put it as a side dish, or we can put it underneath. 
the venison, if we was going to cook venison, wouldn't venison look nice on top of it that? It would look very nice. Or say some of the Chad Von Cannon's sausage on top of that? It would look delicious. All right. There and you know, go. a lot of the lo restaurants that are serving local foods, you will find this very same vegetable with meat on top. All right. And this one here, uh, a lot of times I'll eat it just as it is mm -hmm. right there, just eat it as the chunk. I imagine you could uh, puree it too and or run it through a blender or something like that if you wanted to, but uh, it looks good and it's got all the nutrition in there. So, isn't it fun to eat smart and eat local? David, it is a lot of fun to eat smart and eat simply local.